Thank you for being here. We've been planning to get together with you for some time, and alhamdulillah, now is the, the opportunity for us. Let us uh, talk a little bit about uh, your own, uh, how should I say, transitions uh, that have brought you into Islam. Maybe that would be of interest, right. and then we'll go into other things. Uh, well, I'm originally from uh, California. Um, my father was a university professor in Northern California, and uh, my on my mother's side, actually, they've been in California for over a hundred years, so it's an old Californian family. And I was raised, uh, you know, t Christian background. My father was Catholic, my mother was gr Greek Orthodox, um, but I was actually. Uh, if anything, more uh, towards the Greek Orthodox side. Um, and then 1977, I became Muslim, which uh, was very early on for me, just at my How age. How old were you? I was 17. You were 17. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think what uh, from then just began a journey that uh, took me several different places you know I studied in the Middle East and I ended up in West Africa and Northern Africa but before you 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 get into your odyssey uh, you said that you became a Muslim at the age of 17 right. what brought about this change I mean was there uh, something extraordinary that was happening in your life or were there influences that uh, uh, or was it just your own no I think it's interesting because uh, statistics, statistics have shown that uh, conversion uh, of people to interreligiously, mm -hmm. but also uh, intra-religiously usually occurs uh, between the ages of 12 and, and 21, which people don't realize that. But mm -hmm. it's actually more uh, common for people of a younger age to have uh, religious inclinations than at an older age. And I think maybe some people tend to find uh, religion... Uh, or at least a spiritual tradition, because I was much more interested in spirituality than religion at that age. I think I kind but that of... That is unusual, though. I mean, spirituality well, I had, is a heavy topic. Uh, I, I think for me it was a, a, a confrontation with death at an early age. I, mm -hmm. I was in uh, um, a s serious car accident, and that began a journey of reflection mm -hmm. just about death and the nature of life and the, mm -hmm. also coming to terms with the fact, because I think as individuals, all of us at a certain point in our lives suddenly become aware of our mortality. And for some people, I mean, you're a physician, so I think you know that for some people it, it happens quite late in life, you know. That or perhaps never happens. Or never happens at all until yeah. those last moments. Like uh, even in the Quran points, that story of the of Quran, I mean, at right. the end, he, yes. So people, I think, uh, just the idea of mortality is, is something... Um, that hit me very early on in life and and uh, looking death very close you know up front um, I think will give somebody an introspective perspective and that's what happened to me and and then it began a search because I you know I'd, I was in Catholic schools and uh, and so I had been exposed to religion quite a bit and and I really um, although there I think there's a lot of positive things to religion I think there's a lot of very negative things as well and uh, I think that can be said about any religion, though. No, I, any religion, and I'm using religion in a very broad yes. sense of, mm -hmm. of how we live our lives, mm -hmm. right? But um, particularly, absolutely, I feel how religion manifests in human cultures is, is problematic. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, that's interesting. We'll, we'll come back to, uh, to looking at the religion and faith and spirituality a little bit later. All right. But uh, uh, so that uh, after having gone through... A, an experience. Uh, I, I, I sort of tend to think that a lot of people who convert have some defining moment of, of this kind. Mm -hmm. do, do you agree? Or well, this is another fascinating topic. Um, if you look at the, one of the great conversions uh, in the Islamic tradition is, is Omar oh, ibn al Khattab, and we know that he was literally on his way to kill the Prophet, mm -hmm. uh, peace be upon him. And by the time he gets to the door, I mean, there's a whole side scenario that takes place of going to his sisters. And, but the, in the same day, by the time he gets to the door, he's converting um, to uh, the, the way of Islam. So uh, conversions, it's a 
really unusual so thing. You're, you're saying that there's also this higher dimension. Uh, I think there's so many yeah. variables involved yeah. with conversion itself that it's very hard. People have asked me, how did you become Muslim? And I find that a really hard answer, uh, a question to answer, simply because you're dealing with, with such a multi-dimensional uh, uh, situation. Yeah. And there's so many variables. From, from one perspective, we could say that our journey to what ever unfolds in our life begins literally with inception and there's an argument and it certainly is the Islamic one that it begins prior to it, inception so you know we can look at it materialistically and say well this happened and this happened I was having an identity crisis which according to Erickson's psychosocial theory I mean this is what happens during that period of time yes. we're trying to resolve our identity and things like that so we can look at it from a materialistic mm -hmm. Uh, perspective, but I, I don't think it's it simply uh, can be limited to that. Although there's certainly that element exists, and, mm -hmm. and I wouldn't deny that. Yeah, but I think by the same token, the uh, the kind of experience that sometimes people can can look back to when they were either looking at imminent death, or uh, I mean, I I have this conversation with my patients also sometimes who are going through that, and then they say very clearly that something intrinsically or internally happens to them and their whole view of life life changes, changes. well this is called fitra right I mean this is what the Quran calls fitra which is the inherent nature and I think what happens which is fascinating because my own time of working in critical care which was for about four years and dealing with patients and I was in a cardiac unit so I was dealing with people that were dealing with heart attacks and and it's fascinating to see a vista open up to people that are confronted with their mortality and it can be closed very quickly and oftentimes it's the physician who is complicit in, in the closing of that vista because um, they'll remind them that this is uh, you know things are okay uh, all you need to do I think you know you've had a slight infarct there's not a lot of damage to the tissue you can have a good long life if you just you know cut down on the fat lower your cholesterol and things like this and suddenly you see um, within a period of a, a day or so a patient who has has had this impact in which they're saying wow I need to look at my priorities and what's important in life and where am I going and what's it and suddenly they're back on the phone calling and I think my doctor says I can get back to work by yeah. you know two weeks or a week yeah. and so it's fascinating so I think vistas do open up for human beings and I uh, at the age of 17 chose to to you know Take, yeah, to enter into that vista and really to explore it to its fullest and it, and it ended up in my uh, conversion to Islam. Yeah. And I think that um, somebody would have a very similar experience as I did and, and they might look at and get interested at that vista but turn and get on with life and, yeah. and I didn't and it's, it's been a defining uh, moment for me in my life and a turning That's point. Right. Yeah. Well, but, 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 but you said that uh, you use that moment when the pathway open to to get into Islam. Well, why Islam, though? At that time, if you if you well, I think it. what happened to me is that I, I became interested in in after death, in what happens after death, mm -hmm. and I began to study various traditions, what they said, and I think I was already disappointed with the the Christian uh, tradition in many ways, and partly because of just history of just studying. Uh, I, I find you know European history is is really embarrassing for European Americans, um, but I, I got interest in looking at, at after death scenarios, and I think of all the traditions um, because my background is also comparative religion um, at, and university background, mm -hmm. which I went into later, later obviously, yeah, because right. I did um, the nursing and then I went into comparative yes. religion. Uh, but in, what I, in, if you look at uh, comparative religion tradition, I think what you find is that really Islam has added more to the after death scenario than any other mm -hmm. tradition mm -hmm. prior to it. Um, no, the Christianity has. Yeah, but they Christian. don't have a great detailed account of yes. literally what takes place. Yes. And what I find fascinating is work like of uh, Raymond Moody's Life After Life mm -hmm. and uh, different books. And I actually had, 17 went to see him lecture. Um, that's interesting. And, yeah, and I got interested in near-death experiences because that's really kind of what I had. And I, I, I find it fascinating that many of the experiences that people have are very similar to what uh, has been defined uh, by the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, as what happens after death. Mm -hmm. And one of the signs of the latter days of the human experience, according to the Islamic tradition, is that people will be brought back from death.
Mm -hmm. uh, this is in the um, uh, hadith literature or the mm -hmm. traditions of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Actually, uh, we will we'll get towards the, uh, what Islam says in terms of hereafter, but I'm just keeping track of your story presently. And, uh, so that uh, after this, this, this moment, of this defining moment, if I may put it, you, you looked at Islam because you were studying I was just looking at various religions. I was looking yeah. at different traditions, and particularly with this after death. Uh, yes. And, you know, Islam, it's changing now, but this is 1977, uh, probably 76, 77, uh, prior to the Iranian uh, revolution yeah. and what was happening then. And Islam is just, you know, it's the last place people look in the United States, traditionally. Were you up in San Francisco? I mean, I, you'd look at Hinduism, Buddhism, uh, probably Shintoism or Taoism before somebody think about looking at Islam, mm -hmm. you no, know, right. because there's just such a negative uh, stereotypical image of Islam and the Muslims, and it's also there's this incredibly uh, anti-intellectual backlash. That yeah. I mean, Islam is uh, what what one of my uh, father's friends, um, uh, who was a lawyer, educated person in this country. Um, they were just in conversation and mentioned that Islam was an idiot's religion. Mm -hmm. And my father said, well, you know, my son's a Muslim, actually, and, and I don't think he's an idiot. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's interesting. But you see, you, you, you brought up another topic which, is, uh, which needs some reflection here. And that is that uh, you said the impression of Islam compared to other religions is so terribly negative. Uh, of course, there is a reason for it and uh, I don't it's know. It's historical and there, yeah there's a lot of reasons for it and certainly the historical tension that existed between Christianity and Islam for centuries. I mean Gibbon the, who uh, penned yes. the, uh, the decline fall of the Roman, Roman Empire, Empire said that the, the debate, he termed the, the war between Christianity and Islam as the great debate. Right. And so so that there, Europe has always felt mm -hmm. the pressure of Islam at, at its borders and has had several wars with the Muslims over the centuries. Right. But I think that, um, that, that what's happened in, in the West is that religion in general it has a negative, it's, right. it, it has a negative per perception. And, and part of it is, is you know, the enlightenment period uh, of, of recognizing that, the, that, that religion by and large is fairy tales. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is something, and this is what a lot of modern research is, has, has clearly shown that we're dealing with mythological uh, conditions um, in, in which uh, books were written and uh, pre-scientific, uh, pre-rational, magical worldviews were presented. Yeah, but that's only one aspect of it. I, I mean, you, you, one can, can look at that argument and say, well, yes, that it's is It's a strong that argument, thought. though. It, it is. It, it is partly, partly there. But I don't think that, that one can dismiss uh, the entire, uh, you know, substance of any faith by saying that this is what science a lot of scientists do a well, lot of a lot of modern people do i mean i think that's one of the refreshing things about islam is that islam is it's it's really kind of freed um, religion from a lot of uh, pre enlightenment thinking i mean islam to me is is, is in many ways it's radically postmodern in its approach because well, again because you use the expression postmodern you're, you're falling into a, a going a, a debate again of, yeah. of semantics and right. uh, whether that term which has been coined is uh, is valid in terms of uh, applying to Islam uh, however if if you look if you examine the the polls that are, are generated one of the recent polls that I saw was from from Pew uh, Foundation or what have you and in that poll they said that 95 percent of the people in America believed in God, and a substantial number of them believed in religion. Mm -hmm. uh, if you took those, well, this two, is fitra. I mean, belief in God is a is an inherent uh, you know, part of the human creature. I mean, this is we're stuck with this, whether, whether people like it or not. This is something fundamental to our being: is that uh, from the time a child is 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 little, it's looking for the cause of things. It's asking, what, how, why did that happen? What, what made that sound? What did this? I mean, this is something you see, search for cause. Mm -hmm. And ultimately, the great question is, how did we get here? What is all this stuff? I mean, where did this flesh and blood come from? Where did this incredible synergistic uh, biological uh, species come from? You know, who, where did this eye, who designed the eye? Because we obviously see the form and function 
uh, of the eye very clearly, and, and it would indicate that there is some type of intelligence behind the thing. No, I think so I think people reject this statistical, you know, billions of years of random cosmic. No, I think uh, that that whole uh, theory that this, that science has advanced, that given the right set of circumstances, the world can create itself, is is by and large rejected on the basis of what you've just said, either fitra or uh, intuitively people rejecting this whole notion. So I think that that is becoming more and yeah. more clear. But religion, the belief in religion, ultimately to use the masses as some kind of justification for religion, I think is, is not really... Um, most people don't know anything about their tradition. I would grant it that most Muslims don't know uh, about their own tradition. Same there, the and this is what, what I meant about Islam being radically postmodern, is in the sense that w one of the things that Islam confronts you with is why are you the way you are? I mean, it's, you're just a product of, of the culture that you were born in. And this is something that I became aware of, you know, at an early age. Is the only reason I'm a Christian is because my parents are Christian. The only reason right. that... It's a that congenital it's condition. It's a congenital condition, and I really haven't given it a whole lot of thought. I mean, I was taught that there's a Santa Claus. I was taught that there's an Easter Bunny. Had I grown up in Sri Lanka or, or in... Um, it, it would have been something... In West Africa, they call it Girfaf. They scare people. Instead of the boogeyman, they say Girfaf. It's this, you know, bear-like creature that comes out and snatches little kids that don't do what their parents say. So, I, I mean, you're going to be defined by this cultural environment you're in and this, this historical productivity you know, that we see that, that produces uh, people and their worldviews and their... is something that the Qur'an says, think about this. Yes, no, I think that... Should that, you just be following this thing just because your parents are doing it? No, no I think that, that aspect of, of uh, the spirit of, of rational inquiry that the Qur'an emphasizes to the nth degree, it's something which... which but it's, but it, what I'm pointing out here, I think, is that it's looking at something, not just rational inquiry, it's looking at something really, really deep here, which is, who are you? Mm -hmm. How did your being get formulated to the point where you have all these ideas and opinions? I mean, have you really given these things sure. a lot of thought? I mean, this is a radical, this is late 19th century, this is Nietzschean, this is late 19th century, early 20th century, Heideggerian, right. uh, questioning about one's, you know, Heidegger called it your throneness, yes, right? But, uh, I mean, it's fascinating, the Quran, Ibrahim, uh, the prophet Abraham in the Quran when he points out the stupidity of worshiping idols and 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 at one point they say to him you know well who broke the idols and he said the, the big one did it and they mm. said the big one can't do anything he said well then why are you worshiping them? That's, that's so they correct. can't do any and then it says in the Quran a beautiful expression Raja'u, it says they return to themselves right. in other words Hey, he's got a point here. Mm -hmm. And suddenly this is the vista opening up. Yes. And they chose to not follow it. They said, this is what we found our fathers doing. Mm -hmm. And this is, that is a radical... The it's other a paradigm thing, shift, actually. It's yeah. a paradigm shift. Right. And you can either go with it or become the Inquisition that wants mm -hmm. to put out anybody that's forcing you to have to think yes. about, you know, the radical implications of the new paradigm that's emerging. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, we were pursuing this, this journey of yours. Now, you have uh, just had a, a defining moment or experience, and then you uh, already are pursuing the study of Islam. And then you, later on, you, you go to college or... Uh, Actually, I, I was... Uh, I was in uh, my first semester of college, and I actually, when I became Muslim, I left that. In uh -huh. fact, and then I went to England, and at the age of seventeen. Yeah, and your parents just sort of. Uh, I I had I actually became Muslim uh, like a month or so before my eighteenth birthday, mm -hmm. and so um, yeah, I I left after I spent a short time here. I think about six months. Yes. And then after that, um, I, I left. And I think initially, uh, you know, when you become, uh, when you do something that radical, uh, like changing your, uh, you know, your entire way of life, your entire way of thinking. And Islam is not, you know, Islam is quite monolithic in its, mm -hmm. in its approach. So was it an agreeable parting with your parents or at that time? Did I, I think no, I think initially it was just uh, difficult for my uh, parents to understand. Mm -hmm. and. Both my parents are university educated, sure. are very uh, broad-minded people. I mean, my father was a humanities professor, and 
very philosophical inclinations in his worldview. Mm -hmm. And my mother uh, went to Berkeley, and that says enough. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah. So, um, you know, she was very active in the civil rights movement. I mean, I grew up, uh, you know, she took me when I was 12 to the Soledad brothers. Oh, yes. Uh, to, in, so in the 60s, yeah, yeah. yeah, to George Jackson's um, tr prison trial, just to see, you know, what was happening, that there were political struggles going on in this country. She was very opposed to the Vietnam War. So I did grow up. With uh, a lot of awareness. Of with a, a yeah. lot of awareness, social yes. awareness, very much so. Yes. And, and certainly about the inequities in, in our culture. System. You know, because all, we grew up in, in uh, uh, an area that is you know, probably a more wealthier area. I mean, my family, my close family, there's wealth in my family. My particular family was not wealthy at all. So I did not grow up wealthy by any means. In fact, quite probably up the, more the other end. Um, but idea-wise... Uh, but definitely the area we were in was quite wealthy. And so I think my mother was, you know, wanted to make us sure that we understood that this country has a lot of inequities. Um, so, you know, my sister was in Selma, Alabama, marching with, you know, I mean, we, that's the type of background that uh, we were raised in. And, and the 60s was a fascinating time in this country. You know, Berkeley was right across the street from where I, I grew up, quite literally, and it wasn't far at all. And we were aware that there were big things happening, mm -hmm. you know, in, in, in the States. So I think initially, um, you know, my parents... Uh, they were just perplexed more than anything, and, and my mother's always been very accepting of mm -hmm. whatever any of her children have done. So, that so you helped. went to England, and then you, you... I went to England, and I, and I was with a community there, and, and, and was studying, and uh, they, they uh, were probably more uh, spiritually uh, inclined, and although there was... A were these the or...? No, no, no. No, no. Um, not, no, but... Uh, Probably um, there was a lot of political emphasis too. That Islam is a spiritual political movement. It's mm -hmm. not. It's not politics without spirituality, and it's not spirituality with politics. So there was, I think, so a balance. So you, you still you, agree with that, or you? Oh, very much so. Oh, so. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. I mean, that's we have a personal and a social uh, de uh, transaction here. Yes. You know? right. So I, I, I spent a few years uh, in that community, and then and then what I. But you're not doing anything particularly, you were just... I was uh, studying. I think yeah, I was studying very seriously. Yes. Um, but then at a certain point, um, I, I realized that I wanted to learn Arabic because mm -hmm. I wanted to get into the sources, you know, right. to really yes. experience yes. Islam from the source. And I think being at that age, because I'm still only at this point about 22, uh, for me, it was still probably one of these things that could go either way. You know, there were a lot of people dabbling in religions in the 60s and 70s, and, mm -hmm. you know, you become a Buddhist for a few years. And, right. The and, transitions are, uh, you know. Yeah. So people did their religion thing right. in, in the 60s and 70s. 60s was very much in. To yeah. Sort of, and to yeah. early 70s also. Yeah. You know, it started changing with... Um, you know, I mean, certainly 69 was a big turning point because of the Manson thing that mm -hmm. happened in this country. Mm -hmm. But, uh, you know, and then Jonestown was a major, major uh, disaster, right? disaster to yeah. the idea of uh, communities right. and religious communities. So I think those things were going on, and, and, uh, but I, I definitely wanted to study the, the tradition from the sources. And I got the opportunity from a sheikh who was from Sharjah, Sheikh uh, Abdullah Ali Mahmoud. Mm -hmm who was uh, kind of a minister without portfolio. He was in England at that time. He was in England, and I met him, and I was yeah. just starting to learn Arabic. Right. And he uh, gave me an opportunity to go to the Emirates, and so I went to the United Arab Emirates, and I entered into a Islamic Institute there in Al Ain, mm -hmm. and I studied there, and uh, I spent four years there, and then I actually became an imam in a small mosque. And in Sharjah? In, in, uh, in Al Ain. In Al Ain. Yeah. Yeah. And, yeah, and I lived there, and. And alhamdulillah, it was a very good experience for me. And then I, I, during that time, I had met West African scholars and became very interested in traditional Islam that was still being taught in West Africa. Mm -hmm. And uh, I started studying with them personally. And I had uh, one of them actually ended up living with me in the uh, apartment that I was uh, living at. Mm -hmm. and teaching me personally. So I learned a lot during that period. And then I decided to actually go to... Uh, West Africa. Yeah, West Africa. And, yeah. and that began a whole 
another journey. So the, there you, you, again, you spent quite a bit of time, as I understand. Yeah, I was overseas almost 10 years. Yeah. And there again, you, you were just learning or teaching or... No, uh, I was, I was uh, pretty much committed just to learning and I, I was, I was a Mu'adhan uh, where, where was this at then? one mosque in Alain. Uh, yes. For, uh, because I didn't want to live anymore in the institute's uh, dorm because they were very young. Uh, I don't think a lot of them were as serious as I was. And, mm. you know, they were just young uh, mm. high school students and I was a little older. And, uh, and I think I was probably more serious about what I was doing. Um, mm -hmm. Not all of them, I mean, certainly there were some very good people, but I didn't like the environment. So I asked somebody who was at the Ministry of Endowments, Religious Endowments, mm -hmm. if, you know, they could work out a situation where I could be a Mu'adhan and just live in, because the mosques have, in those mm -hmm. countries, they have uh, living quarters, living quarters next quarters, to them yes. for the Mu'adhan and for the Imam. So I didn't take money for the work that I was doing. I had yes. a stipend from the this institute, mm -hmm. uh, not very much, but, but it was enough, enough to get by. Yeah, and so they let me do that. I was a Mu'adhan, and I lived in the mosque, um, and then I became, after a year of doing that, I learned, the, uh, not very much, but I learned, uh, you know, the last portions of the Quran quite the well, I could write them, uh, right. recite them well, so they let me uh, become an imam in another mosque that was near there. Yeah. And people were very generous to me. That you know, they used to yeah. uh, bring me um, yeah. food and things like that. And but you were now, uh, uh, you know, uh, going through several different cultures all, all of a sudden within a short period of time, in about five, ten years. Yeah. And you, uh -huh. here you were uh, up in Northern California having exposure to Berkeley and all the, uh, the things that you alluded to. Going to England where different culture practically, I mean, although uh, uh, it's Western culture, but then you were interacting with different people. Now, in all of this, uh, your obvious contact with was Muslims, and they were from many different parts of the world, right. as I understand. So what was happening? But yes, <laughs> that, that was the question. Well, that, that's a good question, and I think for me it was a big shock, um, because I think uh, when I became Muslim here, uh, I had no idea because I knew so little about Islam and about Muslim cultures and about Muslim peoples and I mean really vague ideas in my mind about and then suddenly you know there's all this Hollywood stupidity starts re-emerging into the subconscious you know um, Saracens with their um, right. sabers at the gates you know Allahu Akbar and uh, Sinbad and all this nonsense yes. coming out of the subconscious um, so yeah that thrust me on a, just yeah. having a look at a whole uh, and that was a big shock for me, uh, realizing first did, of all... Did it make you sort of doubt your sanity about, uh, or your validity of going into Islam at that point? Uh, the reason I ask that is... I no, that's asked, a good question, because I think there was a, a period um, early on in which I did start questioning that. Mm -hmm. Have I done the right thing? Mm -hmm. Is this really... And I think that is part of what really... Uh, inspired me to want to study the teaching deeply. That's interesting. You know, just to find out. You know, yeah. I've given up my my past, my my background. My, you know, in a, in a sense, my country. Uh, it was a very alienating experience, mm -hmm. and and now I'm kind of wondering, you know, looking around at the Muslims and and the prospects of you know. Of, of the Muslims, uh, it was it was kind of discouraging, and so I, yeah, I think that's a good question because I think I did have that period. And it's hard, you know, we have this fascinating self-delusional uh, uh, states in which uh, we try to remember what actually happened, and we often create, you know, inventing memory is, course, is a yes. fascinating thing because uh, I've tried to do this repeat. Did this really happen, or did mm -hmm. you know? And, and in many ways, I mean, I think this whole idea of past lives mm -hmm. is just our own lives. That's it's it. not about living. You know, <laughs> I mean, how many lives have you had? Yeah. You know, have you thought about that? It's fascinating. <laughs> I'm still thinking about it. Exactly. You know, you think the, the, the time when you're a student. You know, yeah. wow, that was a past life for me. Yeah, you know, right. my pre-Islamic life was a past life for me. My childhood was a past yeah. life. So I yeah. think reincarnation is just. It's, it happens in our own lifetime, yeah. you know. No, it, actually, the reason I asked also this question is that I've sat across from with different uh, people who have converted, and then I've asked them uh, after conversion whether they relented at any point, whether they had any doubts. Uh, it's always that they say 
that it happened when they suddenly met a whole lot of Muslims and with their diversity and complexity and their attitudes and yeah. the inter whole interaction uh, to some of them was very negative yeah. and they said well we, we were really really closed off and we, yeah. we well I've always had mixed uh, I think you know on the one hand yeah there's massive negativity on the other hand there's all these things that we in the West have lost mm -hmm. that that the Muslims still have uh, considerable yeah. amounts of community um, you know family is still very strong uh, also just social relations I mean for instance you know you and I have not known each other uh, a great deal of time and yet you know already bonds are formed very quickly amongst the Muslims mm -hmm. Uh, that don't happen amongst uh, people uh, in, in the West very often is quite rare, mm -hmm. and yet it's quite common in, in the Muslim world. Yeah. So, so I think that so you think that that then uh, Islam is the sort of leveling factor here, which which reduces these barriers amongst Muslims. That's yeah, that's a good question. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think definitely that that. Uh, that when you become a Muslim or being a Muslim is a very powerful uh, uh, force that is not the same as being a Christian or not the same as being a Buddhist or a Hindu or some other religion. I think that, that the, the brotherhood um, that exists in Islam is, is much more powerful than I've seen in other traditions. That, and that is not to deny that there are communities of Christians that don't have deep, deep brotherhood, mm -hmm. but I'm talking about this universal, more global outlook. I think the Amish, for instance, probably have much better community than you'll find almost anywhere in the Muslim world. Oh, a much better support group and yeah, much more of a network. Absolutely. Right. I mean, you might find in the Swat Valley yes. in, in Pakistan or, or the Hunzas or, you yeah. know, or in the Caucasus yeah. Mountains or somewhere, but, but uh, you know, Communities a disappearing phenomenon. I mean, yeah. some people consider it irrelevant in the inform informational period that it was necessary in, in agricultural uh, societies where you need people to stick together and help each other. But when you have these massive megalithic cities in which you've got yeah. this state apparatus, but the state apparatus is falling apart. Yes, of course. I mean, yeah. and now there's this whole modern, you know, communitarianism, they call it, mm -hmm. which is an attempt at reestablishing communities yeah. even within inner there's cities. A, there's a new book, Bowling Alone. You, you read that? I haven't seen it. Right. That's, that's by a guy from uh, the East Coast, Putman, who's, who's postulating this whole thing that uh, America is now becoming uh, very different from what it used to be, where there were bowling clubs and you would go bowling and would there would be opportunity oh, I for bonding, actually did read an bonding about and that. all uh -huh, of that. Sure. So anyway, going back again, uh, no, I, the reason I asked about about Islam as a leveling uh, sort of... I, you know what hit me and probably what silenced me is the word leveling. Yeah. Because this, you know, Kierkegaard's, one of his ideas about the nihilistic age that we're in is that it levels everything. Yeah, no, no. And he used it as a very negative right, term. No, not quite so when you use that word, it just it kind of yes. silenced me. I, no, I, I don't know if that was the appropriate word. It may I think, not be. I think... Um, Equalizing would be a better word, I think, because I think... No, the reason I asked also was Malcolm had that same experience when, I mean... Uh, it, when he went what on really Hajj. he... What, right, what, right, what really... Uh, sort of well, Hajj, Hajj is a is a definitely leveling experience. Yeah, but still, he he, as much as there was that spiritual bonding which occurs in Hajj and all of that, but to see the humanity interacting with yourself in, mm -hmm. uh, at at that level of equality was, mm -hmm. I thought, what. Uh, well, this is one of the fascinating again. You know, one of the, the, the conditions that we're finding ourselves in is that provincialism is uh, increasingly becoming uh, detrimental to the human condition because massive groups of peoples of different backgrounds and cultures are, are thrust together mm -hmm. in mega cities like Los Angeles and Burbank and these places. And suddenly it's, you know, you've got a, a, a Korean for a neighbor or you've got a, a Vietnamese for a neighbor and your son might have been in Vietnam and suddenly it's having to deal with human beings that are very different from yeah. yourself and I think that's one of the things that Islam does to us is that it forces us yeah. to deal with otherness uh, in a way that is not alienating but is in fact bonding oh, and, and what, what you know the otherness of color of language of, is broken down yeah. by, by the, 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 the sameness mm -hmm. of belief
that transcends whatever differences that people do have at these exterior levels that ultimately our, our basic impulses are pretty fundamental. I mean, we're dealing with people that want the best for their family. Yes. This is a universal course, human yes. situation. Yes. We're dealing with people that um, want to live harmoniously, that don't want to, to be violated or, or violate right. others. I mean, I think the vast majority of human beings share some pretty same fundamental, values, right. basic uh, virtues. And all religions have those, the same core of values, more or less, and to that extent. It's just how do we achieve them? Absolutely. This is, this yeah. is the crisis. I mean, yeah. we can all agree, yeah, let's all be human. Right. Yes. But how but do we do that? How do we become human? Yes. And this is where the whole issue becomes problematic, and I think this is where Islam's agenda for humanizing people is so radical. Well, I don't know whether you would call it agenda. It's a process, I think. Uh, well, I'm using agenda. Say, See, we're looking at <laughs> negative terms. Agenda see, yes. can be, a, yeah. Yes. I mean, I, Islam does have an agenda, and its agenda is to transform people into, uh, into kind of uh, crude uh, semblances of, of, of Beni Adam or the Adamic species to a true Adamic being, a true human being. I mean, I definitely think with that's... With a conscience. With a conscience. Right. And, and the most radical way of doing that is having people pray together five times a day. Yes, of course, yes. You know, you're praying in a line, in a rank, with people, a, a, a black man is on, on your right side, a white man's on your left side, a Chinese, a, you know, and this is something pretty extraordinary. Yes. No, and, and the whole idea of having being forced to touch them, yes. you know. Yes. Which is not, shouldn't be feel forced. It should be a longing or a desire for that closeness and that intimacy that takes place in prayer. So that the social aspect, Ramadan. Yeah, you know, no, I think there's no question that uh, in, in all those in And those universalizing practices. Ramadan. Yes. The idea that we're all one-fifth of the world's population is yes. fasting. Yes. One month out of the year together. I mean, you talk about harmonic convergence. So you spent about ten years... Uh, and and oh, North, yeah, then I came back here. You you came back to Northern California again. Uh, actually, Southern California. I and see. I, and I studied. Uh, um, I was studying homeopathy, and then I was studying. Uh, I went into a nursing program and completed a nursing school. Yes. Uh, program. Then I uh, went. Uh, I was working in nursing, and then uh, went back to the university to do a program in comparative religion. So, How long did that take for you? Um, well, altogether it's been about uh, seven years. Mm -hmm. So you finished that? Yeah, I'm, I'm actually now uh, going to probably, hopefully next year, be doing some graduate work. Wonderful. Yeah. So where are you finding all this time? Well, it's, it's making time for, I mean, I'm very, uh, very time conscious. I'm conscious of the hourglass ticking away, so I just try to utilize well, in that in San Manafi Absolutely, yeah. man is in loss with yes. time as passage, except for those who don't waste their time. That's right. So I just try not to waste time. Yeah. Time is very valuable to me. What uh, have you? What sort of relationship now uh, have you got with your parents? Is that all? Oh, wonderful! Really, absolutely. So they yeah, my, both my parents have a great. Uh, my sister became Muslim. Uh, all of my family now has a very good idea of what Islam is. And I've done it, I think, hopefully in a way that, you know, I'm not condemning them or just, you know, just I think they all have an idea of what my life's about. And, and I think all of them, uh, they're very impressed with, mm -hmm. you know, I've won. I mean, it's quite difficult to have successful marriage in, in this modern 20th century yes. late part of it in, in California. Yes. And, uh, you know, alhamdulillah, my children are, uh, thanks so God, they very go healthy. They visit their and grand, grandparents yeah. and all that. So I think, you know, generally they're, they're very pleased. Yes. Well, that's nice. Now, uh, coming back to, uh, to Islam and, uh, of course, uh, its impact on your own life, which uh, is, uh, which is obvious since you're quite actively engaged in, in learning and teaching. And now, uh, what difficulties do Muslims have in presenting Islam to the West in a proper way? Because we talked earlier on about how Islam is perceived. We didn't talk about our own 
role uh -huh. or our own responsibility of how we have either well, failed I, or succeeded. That, good points. I think part of it is the fact that uh, I think Islam is misperceived by the Muslims as well. <laughs> I mean, it's not just a misperception that the Western people have, it's also a misperception that the Muslims have. And, yeah. and part of that is the fact that, that Islam has been reinvented, or, you know, what, what they term in, in uh, philosophy or religious studies, redacted um, by uh, late 19th century and 20th century um, modernist uh, revisioners of Islam. Um, people have been called the reformers, some people call them the deformers. Um, Who the, do you mean? I mean, I don't really like to get into specific uh, individuals because I think you're dealing with, on the one hand, uh, infiltration into the uh, Islamic academic cadre, which is um, which is quite pernicious. But on the other hand, you're dealing with just unfortunately people that were caught up in the flow of what was happening. I mean, when the Muslims were defeated by the colonialists, this was a great shock to the Muslim Ummah. And, and I think what, what happened is suddenly they were having to deal with the fact we've been defeated by uh, the Europeans who for centuries the Muslims had looked down on them as being unworthy of even their consideration. And you can see some of the letters that were written by Muslim rulers, unfortunately, to uh, the Europeans uh, really with disdain and, 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 and uh, loathing. And so, uh, you know, I think that, that, that uh, one of the things that God does is um, but do you, do you he cures that? people uh, with the thing that, that, you know, with the medicine that they need to be cured and the medicine of arrogance and pride. Uh, you know, the medicine is very bitter medicine. It's called humility and, uh, and submission. And, and I think what's happened to a Muslim world that became very arrogant and very prideful, uh, we have really been humiliated. And if we don't learn this lesson... But you have know, we, that's what my question is. I'm asking, is there you... You say that we our noses have been rubbed into the ground. Yeah. And I don't think and we've learned the lesson yet. No, that's what I'm, that's what I'm saying. But, okay. but the wonderful thing about life is it keeps teaching the same lesson over and over again. And unlike school here where you can keep graduating on without having learned anything in the previous year. They'll put you to the next year. It doesn't happen in life. Life will just keep giving you the same lesson over and over again. And you get your diploma when you get the point. Right, and, and, and we haven't gotten the point because well, Muslims still think somehow that la ilaha illallah um, gives you some uh, uh, exalted position uh, by the mere fact that you state that. Well, if that was true, then the, the hypocrites would certainly not be in the lowest portion of hell because they say that too. So la ilaha illallah uh, really on the saying tongue, that on saying it has no. Uh, it, you know, no meaning unless it's emanating from Doesn't the heart. Doesn't get you any bonuses. And obviously. if it emanates from the heart, it manifests on the limbs. And if it manifests on the limbs, you have a human being that's called a Muslim. And if it's not, you have somebody that the Quran clearly defines as a hypocrite, a munafiq. Somebody that, in fact, the way the Quran articulates is, يُخَادِعُونَ Allah وَالَّذِينَ آمَنُوا وَمَا يَخْدَعُونَ إِلَّا أَنفُسُهُمْ They attempt, and it's mukhada'a in the Arabic language is an attempt. Okay. They attempt to fool Allah and those who believe and they only succeed in fooling themselves and there's another version which is the Warsh version which says and they only attempt to fool themselves in other words the self-delusion ultimately yeah you can be self-deluded but ultimately you know in reality what the truth is so then you know to, to, to summarize that uh, what we are saying here then is that the prevailing attitudes within the Muslim community is that they haven't really, really come to grips with the humiliating defeat and therefore they will continue to... And this is why we go around Christian bashing, which is a very common uh, Muslim activity, mm -hmm. you know, um, to feel good about ourselves, to right. point out how horrific the Christians are. Why, no. why is it that there is a change? I mean, what, what is happening, though? What do you think? <laughs> let's, let's examine what, that. Why isn't why, there a change? Why aren't we looking at Well, they say the best definition have, of madness... Do we have the Rishava or... They say the best definition of madness is to do the same thing over and over again and expect different results. <laughs> yeah. <that's laughs> so I think, I, in one sense, we've been afflicted with a type of madness. And, 
unfortunately, post-traumatic stress syndrome is, you know, it, it has deep uh, repercussions. And, and I think the Muslim Ummah as a body is yes. suffering from post-traumatic stress yeah, syndrome. Yeah, well, but then what are the remedies? Do we, where, where is the CPR? I mean, we're now talking about... <laughs> uh, uh, where, where is the CPR? Well, right. you need doctors and nurses for that. And <laughs> yes. this is a good point, because yes. I think part of our, our, our struggle is the fact that we do not have any more institutions that are producing human beings of a brilliant intellectual caliber and a spiritual depth that can not only diagnose but also treat the patient and traditionally this has been the realm of the, the you know the the, the ulama al-amidun who are called the awliya mm -hmm. the people that are are close to to god in their knowledge and in their action and those people traditionally have guided the muslims through their devastating periods of time well you can see quite literally that uh... in the, and i don't like to get into colonial bashing because i think it's a real dead end for the muslims victimization is a dead end road but uh... nonetheless there are some important features that need to be looked at and one of them is the fact that our our, our libraries our scholars um, our, uh, you know, khanaqas and, and madrasas and tekkes and all these places where there was spiritual preparation, intellectual preparation of, of the Muslims, they were literally shut down. Mm -hmm. And not only that, but the, uh, the governments that were uh, created, uh, and social reform in, in Syria is a good book to look at, talks about this. The governments that were created were created by the colonialists. And this is the fifth column, which ultimately I've never seen historically, and, and historians would obviously verify this or negate it, but I personally have not seen uh, historically where there was a conquering of a people without that fifth column element. And this is why the Quran says, that the hypocrites, they are the true enemy and may Allah destroy them. Because these are the people that have been complicit with um, the, the, the colonial enterprise and the neo-colonial, and we can almost say, why say neo-colonial? Because as far as I'm concerned, colonialism's never ended. It's just changed forms because, uh, you know, uh, the chameleon-like nature of the West is one of its most uh, extraordinary features, that it's able to um, change its... Uh, it's, it's form. It's cloak, yes. And this is what uh, media and television is all about. Yeah, well, that is now cultural imperialism. We, 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 we will come to that. But then uh, what you're again pointing out is that uh, we are indeed in a double jeopardy, if I might put it. That one, one is, one is uh, that uh, we feel that there is a, a conspiracy that the West has on one hand. On the other hand, we do not seem to acknowledge uh -huh. that we uh, are no more the power uh -huh. and we are nothing in terms of amounting to anything in right. the scheme of things. Right. Well, so, neither was the prophets Medina in the 7th century. So yes. we shouldn't forget that. No, we shouldn't. And the Quran very clearly says, Come in fi'atin qalila, gharabat fi'atin kathira, bi'idhnillah. How many times have a small faction defeated a great faction right. by the permission of God? Yes. And so we have... You know, the Muslims, if they're uh, obeying their teachings and, and practicing, then they have a permission, they have an authority, which is very powerful, yes. and we shouldn't underestimate it. Yes. You know, but I, I think it's, you know, it's a good point that, that if, you, if you look, you know, wh why isn't anything happening? And I think part of it is the fact that, that if you look at the disease, which I feel the greatest articulation of it from the, from the Islamic perspective is the word itself which is used to designate everything that is against Islam, and that is jahiliya. Mm -hmm. And jahiliya is a word that in its root meaning means ignorance. And this is the whole argument of Islam, that you, you reject the truth out of ignorance, that you only do things that are bad out of ignorance. And this is Socratic teaching as well. I mean, even the Europeans have this idea that, that um, you know, that people don't do bad things if they really knew what they were doing. And this is part of what Islam does, is it, it's, it's, you know, or what God does through Islam is literally to open the eyes of people, to let them see. I mean, one of my favorite things that's happened in recent uh, popular culture is this Kathy Lee Gifford incident. And there was a wonderful picture of her in Newsweek that obviously got out some television broadcasting, which is where she's got this horrified look, like, you know, a shocked look when she finds out that she's been supporting uh, child labor. This whole country is supporting child labor. The clothes we're wearing are supporting child labor. The tennis shoes that we jog in are supporting child labor. The soccer balls, the baseball bats that we hit our baseballs with, I mean, the whole thing is supporting child labor. Don't blame Kathy Gifford. Blame the whole country.
Yes. You see, and this is what people don't want to deal with, is that, no, we have to look deeply at what's going on. Well, the human so then this, this, what you're saying that, I mean, uh, the example that you've used is, is, uh, uh, is, is of, uh, uh, how should I say, of, of, of using people or of uh, abusing people to, to, to create the, the, to support the consumerism or what have you. But getting away from, from the, the, because that brings us to the issue of justice and economic justice and right. then the Quran. We'll get into that. But uh, let us talk a little bit now of, of why is it that looking at all of the, the Muslim countries, 50 and odd, 55, 56, I don't know. What, the, whatever the numbers. Whatever the yeah. numbers. They've grown there is, the there still isn't either an awareness, one, or acknowledgement, uh -huh. or formulation uh -huh. of some kind of vision or strategy. Uh -huh. What is our worldview now? Well, this is part of the crisis again. Yes. I mean, we're, we're, we're an ummah in search of a worldview. One of the things that David Chittick, uh, uh, in his vision, vision, the of, vision yes. of Islam, wonderful book, this is one of the things that he puts forward, is that the Muslims have lost sight of a Quranic worldview, you know, the Weltanschauung, the Weltanschauung. of, of, of uh, what, you know, it's not this, uh, what Guy Eaton in the Islam and Destiny Man calls a Boy Scout religion. This is what we've been reduced to thinking that Islam is. It's, it's going around doing good deeds. Mm -hmm. No, it has a way of viewing the world, a vision. Yeah. And if you don't have the vision of Islam, no matter how sincere your efforts are, you're not going to be anything other than a glorified Mormon or a glorified... Uh, you know, Jehovah's Witness or somebody who's out because they're doing good deeds. Yes. I mean, that doesn't, the, the moral element of Islam is not uh, what makes us uh, unique as, as a community because every community has a moral element. No, it's, it's the vision, it's what the tradition was called the aqidah. Mm -hmm. It was the understanding that Islam imparted to human beings which enabled not only the morality to function but also for there to be an absolute clarification mm -hmm. of what exactly morality is. Yes. Because there's a great deal of confusion in, in, in our modern uh, world, for so, instance. But there is confusion within the Muslims too. That's Absolutely, because we don't have this thing anymore. No, so you're not, asking... Not only that, but the, the thing that, that is interesting now is that there are Muslims and there are pious Muslims. Wonderfully uh, pious. Wonderfully pious. Absolutely. But then, uh, if you look at that, if you look at the, the whole world of Islam at presently, these Muslims which, who are pious, some of them, very few of them, are also actively engaged in a social emancipation right. so of, of the rest of, uh, the, rest of the world. Well, this is the separation of deen from millah. Yes. Because Islam has these two concepts. It has the personal, which is deen. This is our relationship with God. But it also has the millah, which is the collective uh, group of what our goal is as a collective body yeah. and the goal of the collective body is the establishment of social justice right which is called sharia the sacred law now one of the things that you know but I, I want you to answer well also. This, uh, this is important because yeah. we get back to this yeah. colonial idea yeah. the Quran very clearly says Len yehudu wa la hatta the, 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 the Jewish tradition and the Christian tradition which is not religious it's their social phenomenon which I now think is, is Europe and, and America this is the Judeo-Christian phenomenon mm -hmm. they will not be content until you follow their Milla. Mm -hmm. Now, in the Quran, it does not say deen, mm -hmm. which is their personal piety or their personal transactions with God. No, it says their milla, it, how they function of a collective body. Now, the dominant uh, milla of our, our, of our modernist condition is the consumer society. Yeah. This is the idol of the age, consumption, yeah. that we were born to, cre to consume. Now, first of all, two interesting things to note. One is that consumer in Old English means the devil. And the Quran says, إِنَّ الْمُبَدِّرِينَ إِخْوَانَ shayateen. The, those who are ex gratuitously extravagant are the uh, companions or the, uh, or the brothers, the brethren of the sayateen, mm -hmm. the shayateen, who are, you know, this perverse element in human society and in the human heart, which yeah. is calling people to lower functions. 
And so the, the idea of the consumption now is, is being presented to the world as the salvation. Consumerism. As salvation, right. that you will be happy through buying, yeah. that you will be happy if you will have all those goods that are going to make you yeah. happy. This is the constant message of the television, the constant message of media, the message of government. More. If well, we can just make more schools, if we can just put more computers in the schools, if we can just have more prisons, there will be less crime. So everything is more. That, unfortunately, and, is a part of capitalism. Absolutely. Well, yeah, at its mm. last stages. But, but what Islam is saying is no. By having less, you have more. By diminishing your exterior wants and increasing your in, in, interior wants. Because we have interior and exterior wants. Our interior wants are not the same. Because if I'm cold, it's my body that's shivering. It's mm -hmm. not my soul. Mm -hmm. and, and I can deal with that. I just put a blanket on and, and I can resolve that uh, crisis. Mm -hmm. But if my soul is shivering, then what do I use to cover up that? Well, you can attempt to put a blanket, which is what consumerism is. You see, no, 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 buy, and the blanket doesn't work. Well, here, here's a new and improved, right? This right. is what they love to use in their commercials. The new and improved blanket. This will really make you warm. Oh, this new car. Wait till you get this new stereo, this new television. It just keeps going and going and going. And in the end, this human being is left consumed. Because the consumer is ultimately consumed, because life consumes us.